thank you very much. Um, so I'm a composer and a sound designer, and so my work, I typically, I do a lot of live performance, and I write stuff for film, and a lot, a lot, an awful lot for theatre. I'm actually writing an opera at the moment, which is a bit, woo, a bit scary. And um, I think what you'd call me is a multi-instrumentalist. I play, like a lot of composers, I play a lot of instruments, not that well, but well enough to sort of get inside them. And um, <laughs> I arrive rather late, as you know, but um, I have got a mechanical device here I want to show you, something I built, which I'll get into the reasons why I built it. But I thought what would be quite good, because we've got the aims here, and because I've brought things that relate to the aims, is if we indulge in a bit of, I think the expression is organology, a bit of organology, where um, we look at some of the more unusual instruments and think about how they might relate to the aims. Now, the first one I need this chair for. Later on, I'm not going to be playing it over here. I'm going to be playing it over there, but I want you to see it, so I'm going to go and get it. And this relates, actually, I'll start, I'll build up to it. <laughs> Keep the suspense. Um, so... The instrument that I absolutely love the most might surprise some of you, given that I've got so many to choose from. And it's this, it's my trusty recorder, because I'm a sort of um, very into music of the 18th century. And what you have to know about 18th century music, where the recorder was so precious, the king would get three recorder players from France and build a special gallery. I'm waiting for this to happen, by the way. Get a recorder player from France and build a special gallery to put them in so everybody could hear them in the distance. What I love about the recorder is that we kind of think it's pretty straightforward, and it is. But it's straightforward, and this relates to this machine. It's straightforward because there's no resistance to the air. There's no reed or anything like that. So every nuance of your breath show so you can do so 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 it's very very sort of expressive and you can feel the human in it and when i play the recorder what i love to do are these things called preludes so the preludes was this sort of big con a bit like blues players that always play the same improvisation a bit suspiciously so what the uh, what the preludes were they were they were sort of quasi improvisations where kind of everybody you knew that you got them from a book but you kind of did your own thing, and it was all about going, oh, I think this, and then I think that, sort of. And, and the reason I wanted to play you that is, um, A, because I'm trying to sort of evangelise about the recorder, but also because I think you can hear partly because I'm sort of slightly out of breath, you can hear my breath in the note. And that's the exciting thing about pipes, which is sort of surprising, and why they're so much more interesting than MIDI instruments, is because when you've got a pipe, it sings, and there are two things that affect its pitch. We all know the idea of, like, a low pipe makes a deeper note, but there's something else at play, and that's air pressure. You can never divorce the pressure which affects the loudness from the pitch so all the time very subtle on the recorder you're kind of playing a game with am I going to drop the loudness a bit and up uh, and make it quieter you know how far can I make it quieter without bending the pitch too much now that's the art of playing the recorder, but there's an even earlier instrument in the recorder where this is like up to 11, this effect, and I absolutely love it. And you'll see why I was going to play it over there later, but as I've got it, I'll bring it over. It's called a portative organ. It's, it's an organ. It's called a portative because in theory, the idea was that you'd go around the stations of the cross and be able to accompany the, the plays that were going on. But as you can see, they're not quite portative because they've grown a bit over the last few centuries. The, you know, they, they were sort of first ones from the 13th century. This one's, you know, 14th. Oh, right. So, this idea that you can never separate air pressure from pitch is really exciting when you play the portative organ. And this relates very strongly to what the Ames was doing. And I want to ask Sam how... Sorry. It's 
Not quite the right size, but it'll do. I'm pushing air through and I'm opening up stops and my, the air from my arm, from this arm full of air by these bellows, is going through the pipes. And eventually I run out, but before I run out, I can decide on the pressure because I want to scoop the volume like a singer, but the pitch is going all over the place. But you learn to sort of sculpt the pitch and the volume at the same time. <laughs> Anyway, so that's a portive organ, and that's it's not something you get to see every day. I thought I'm going to use it in the set later, but I wanted to show it because I can hear that. So, Sam, have you got a pressure control on your pipes? Uh, mm, ish. <laughs> ish. Yes, bas I mean, basically, yes. Yes, because you can hear, because you can, I could, yeah. So you could, there's scope to undulate so the, the pitch. With the, um, with the blowers, which are the fan ones, the problem that you have with those in pressure terms is that you can't go from a greater pressure to a very much lower pressure fast. You can it only ever decelerate. Right, yes, yeah. yes. So that's what you often discover, because I, I build instruments, and what you often discover is that something, the most simple thing, like a volume control, on something that's a pipe, it's just a whole heap of questions and not trouble, but it's like also a whole heap of possibilities. And that to me is the, uh, what's exciting about instruments. So I'm just gonna show you a couple of others before I go onto the bells. Okay, right, so um, this, in theory, I meant to play this between your legs, but I'll drop it. This is um, a clavis imbalum. So a clavis imbalum, <laughs> this would have been about the 13th century. And as um, we arrived late, mine sounds like it hasn't been tuned, tuned since the 13th century, but I'll play it anyway. Um, if you imagine, people were playing things like dulcimers and psalteries like this, and things like um, the cymbalon, you know, with the beaters. And then for the first time ever, somebody thought, why don't we put a keyboard on that? Although it wasn't, that was the first time anybody had made an instrument with a keyboard, why don't we put a keyboard on our psalteries and then we'll be able to play them faster. And what will happen is when you press a key, we'll get a little quill, a little bit of feather quill, and we'll pluck the string. And that was the beginning of the keyboard age. So this is essentially a copy of the very earliest keyboard instrument. And what I love about it is it's much more exciting than a harpsichord. I love the harpsichord. But this sounds like it could have come from anywhere in the world because, and I apologize for the tuning because we haven't tuned it yet. Um, it's got a much, much longer ring than a harpsichord. It's much more jangly. Apologies to the vegans in the room. Um, they've given me the original loot, a mute material, which was a piece of elk skin that you just touch the strings with. So I just, the reason I wanted to show you that, apart from anything, was to say that, um, yes, yeah, so when I play it, I mean, if it sounds a little like a cymbal on, which is the Russian instrument. That's not surprising. I actually picked this up in Latvia 
And the reason it's quite interesting to tell you that is because of the animals inside, because um, I had it made specially, because I, I was given a, some grant to do some stuff with, and I thought, I want to get a Clavis in Barlam made, and, um, <laughs> and not knowing they were about to have a pandemic. And, <laughs> and um, the chap who made it, he said, oh, you know, we always paint the insides, what would you like? And I said, oh, I'm doing this album about London, Ealing Feeder, available in all good shops. Uh, this um, album about London, could you put the Thames in it? And he said, well, I don't do rivers. He said he did animals. So he asked me to give him some names of some animals to put inside it. And I sent him some suggestions of London animals. I said, could have a squirrel, some squirrel or a fox or a pigeon. But it was all done through Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> and there was a mix up between the ands and the ors. And uh, so basically, he drew them all. But um, it's very likely, you know those medieval pictures, he doesn't mean to London, you know those medieval pictures of lions where you think they haven't seen a lion? Well, <laughs> that is not a London fox. I'm sure there are foxes like that. I know there are wolves actually in Latvia. I'm sure there are wolves like that in Latvia, but that is not a London fox. So it's, it's just a fact, I love it. It's a, for me, the pictures are very like the instrument itself. It's this sort of wonderful confluence of um, Eastern European graphics and you know, sort of uh, London uh, uh, animals, and, and, and the instrument is similarly like that. Now, the reason I'm telling you all this about these instruments, apart from the fact that I hope you find them of interest, the other one I won't go into much detail in, but I will play it briefly later, is the theremin, which I'm sure you know. The reason I'm telling you all this, oh, and the bells, is that you can start to see a problem, is that I play all these instruments, <coughs> and you can only play one at once, and you've only got two pairs of hands. And um, so sometimes I write music for other people to play. Sometimes, I, many times, I work with other composers and sorry, other performers. But they got to a point where I realised I needed to sort of have myself with something else going on. And I did the obvious thing at first, which was to go out with a laptop and, you know, put some write some sounds and, you know, have them play underneath me and dilly d, And um, it didn't work very well because um, it had lost a lot of... It had lost a lot of the sort of live excitement of another flesh and blood musician in the room. And very like Sam, I realised what I needed to do was think about what the computer was good at, which is, you know, data crunching and... Uh, pattern recognition and, you know, taking a microphone signal and all of that and processing it and think, and then think, what is exciting and um, what can I put ex at the end of it that is more exciting than uh, yet more samples? Um, so um, I thought, well, I'll just sort of build things like this where I take a real, a real world instrument, which is lots and lots of little Hungarian handbells, and um, get the computer to come up with the patterns and get this to play it. So it's a bit like having my riffs on the laptop, but something more exciting. And for me, um, and probably just people have heard this before, but I, I'll just sort of repeat it. For me, the reason it's of interest, and I think this fits very much with what Sam was saying, is first of all, I think we're hungry for things like that. We don't see stuff like this. <laughs> yeah, strangely enough, we don't see stuff like either of these very often. And I know, as a, somebody who loves instruments, I know there is a sort of excitement when you bring a physical object of beauty, maybe that's not quite so beautiful, a physical object of beauty into the room. Also, you're getting a lot for free because you, you're using real objects, like Sam's using pipes and bowls and things. I'm using little school handbells from Hungary. And um, there's a lot of richness in them that you just, whoops, you just don't get um, in samples. You know, there's the fact that I, I'm a bit nervous about um, mucking them up because I've just got here. Oh, there's a little bit. They've got really, really beautiful, what we call temperament, the way that the individual notes are tuned, because they're, they're not done to um, 
a conventional Western European scale, but a scale that they use a lot in Hungary, a temperament, a way of tuning that they use a lot in Hungary. And when they're all playing together, they all sort of work in sympathy. And so, you know, one bell sets off another bell, and it's something that you could never... We could model it on a computer, but you'd have a very hard job, whereas if it's the actual bells in the actual room hitting one another and going off in, reson in sympathy with one another, you get all that for free. Um, the other thing I love about them, and you, mo you probably won't hear this till the set, so I'll describe it, because I'm still setting them up, but I'll give it a quick go, is that they're very good um, for things where you want to write something that you have in mind that is, what I could say, beyond the envelope of a human player. So something that I wish I could play it, but I can't. And so going back to my sort of roots in Baroque music, we have this thing called the double. So a double is, I'm not very good at the double, especially when I'm cold, but a double is, so if, if there was a tune that went... Then the double is where you put in a half beat, a tune on the half beat. Like that sort of thing. That's called the double, and it was always a thing you did. You'd do a tune, and then you'd go, ah, oh, here's my double. And what's great about, um, <laughs> the great about these bells is, of course, they find that a lot easier than I do. And so what happens is I can write a tune, and then partway through a track, I can get it to do a double, and it can do it automatically, and it can do it so fast, it just becomes this sort of haze of metal. And I, I really love the sound because I think what I love is that it becomes indeterminate. You can't quite tell what the note is. It just becomes a sort of, like, like Sam was saying, a texture. And I think that is generally what I get excited about with all these instruments and the way they can be put together is I'm much less interested in what I'd call harmonic complexity, the way that a lot of... Because I work in the classical idiom, but a lot of classical music, it's like they've taken this representation of all these sounds, which are notes, and actually it's a very, very bad shorthand for what sound does. I'm an acoustician. Notes are not where it's at. Waveforms are where it's at, you know. Notes is just this very, very basic way to kind of pass down information about tunes, you know, score. And then they've then taken the representation and then used that as the thing that they muck about with, not the sound itself. And then to make more and more complex things, they kind of jiggle the notes around, you know, harmonically, you know, more and more complexity. And, I, and, and what you end up with is, you know, things like Wagner, say, you know, which is, to me, feels like a room with too much furniture in it. It's just like, ah! you know, and, uh, and to me, what's interesting is if you pull the camera back and say, oh, you remember when we were playing that and we weren't looking at the notes, we were looking at the insides of the notes. We were looking about, oh, you know, this stuff I was trying to demonstrate. It was never about the notes. It was about the air and what you're doing to the air and what you were doing to the room. And... I get excited by the timbres in these things and the way they can go together. And I won't have time to demonstrate it today, but maybe another time. Um, one thing I'm looking at at the moment, which computers are fantastic for, is imitating timbres. So, a very straightforward example, which you'll hear later, working with Dan Stowell a few years ago. So Dan is an acoustic, bioacoustician. So he uses acoust acoustics, acoustic analysis to look at, for example, species counting. So, you know, imagine that you could listen to the morning, the dawn chorus, and work out how, how many starlings there were. That's the kind of big questions that they're trying to answer. So part of his research, a sort of side product of his research, was he got this stream of data of this dawn chorus in, uh, not Latvia, but just down the road in Estonia. And then he was able to give that to me and then I was able to write a little bit of code that took that and then played it back on the bells so I can listen to almost like a, a very rough sort of representation of a dawn chorus. And I wouldn't say you know it's a dawn chorus, but there's something about it that's very birdy. And, and as a recorder player, we love imitating birds, so that, that made me very happy. And then the other type of representation, and this is what I'm getting into at the moment in this, for this thing I'm writing that's opening in Auburn next year, 
is this thing called spectralism. So with spectralism, we're at the stage now, and this wasn't possible five years ago, with spectralism, I can play, you know, like a, a ding on that, you know, quite apart from the fact it's out of tune. Got um, you know, the, the C-sharp on that is wild, wildly different to the C-sharp on that because it, it's, got a different, it's got different spectral qualities. You know, this one starts with a sharp attack and then dies away. This one is like a big sort of wash, like a big licorice wash of, wash of sound. So that's about the attack and decay of the spectrum. But also, this one's much brighter because it's got lots of higher notes in it, higher frequencies that sound when it plays. And this one's much more mellow because it hasn't got all so many of those higher frequencies when it plays. And what we're able to do now, it's pretty amazing, um, using some uh, research at Berkeley, or is it Berkeley or Berkeley? That, that, you know, in America, and in America, and um, ERCAM, is we're able to take, I'm able to play, play this, like that, on this instrument, analyse it with machine learning, and tell it what my ensemble is that I want to copy that, and I will get a best match. So, for instance, um, I might have a gong playing in the opera, and then the singers and the percussionist will have a way to go uh, like that, or uh, like that with the gong, and get a very, very close spectral facsimile of the original sound. So you can have this sort of eerie sort of give and take. Anyway, so that's where I'm at. And um, I will just very briefly, this I'm still setting up, so you'll hear a bit more of it later, but I'll very briefly show you this. So there are 28 bells. Um, so this is going to be the briefest of the brief demo because it's still not calibrated because of what happens with these bells is as I walk around, as, as I travel with them, they jiggle about, but yeah, they need calibrating. You can hear that. But basically, each bell is attached to a motor, but they're not, they're not actually calibrated yet. And so all I do is I just send a little bit of data to them, and, and more than one can play at once. But you'll hear them later, and then, with any luck, if they're going to plan, I'm just going to unswitch them off because they need calibrating. But um, you'll hear them doing um, a few numbers and possibly some birdsong imitation. So anyway, um, I hope that's of use. And um, as I say, I do, see a f I do see the family resemblance between this and this, so uh, that's quite exciting. Thank you. <laughs> much Sam for inviting me along and this is a complete treat playing next to um, an invention like this because I'm really into new instruments and this acoustic is to die for so um, we did get stuck on the M40 so this is uh, a bit of a bit of a super it's a bit of a super of a set but hopefully it'll all make sense and um, because we got stuck on the A40, I haven't tuned in my theremin yet, but that's a good, a good excuse to show you the theremin. Most of what I'm going to do tonight is acoustic, but because I'm doing a lot of stuff in imitation of birds tonight, um, I couldn't resist doing one theremin number. Um, so I'm just going to tune in my theremin. So I'm sure most of you have seen one before, but for those of you, oh, there's a few heads going like that. So for those of you who haven't, sorry it's over here, but we're trying to sort of spread ourselves around. A theremin... Actually, I'll put it out here. It'd be easier for me to play around here. A theremin. Um, sorry, I try not to get it too close to the other instruments. Um, it was invented very early, 1919, and you don't touch it to play it. You move nearer and further the aerials. I'm a little bit close to the bell rig, but going as far as I dare without falling off the stage. You, you play it by... Um, moving near the aerials, and sorry I'm in the corner here. Um, so, this one is pitch, and this one is volume. 
And you'll notice I go in and out with that one and up and down with that one. And that was, again, a brilliant invention from Termin, Leon Termin, which is to uh, make sure that this movement and this movement don't get muddled up. So you have them orth orthogonal to one another. Um, it's not in tune, so I'm now going to tune it in. Uh, this is how you tune a theremin in. So what you're doing, by the way, is you're trying to find the beats, the point at which it's so low, the vibrations are individual beats, and you want those to be roughly at the length of your arm. Lovely. <laughs> so that's me theremin. These are the bells. Yeah, they're still working. OK, right, so here goes. So as I say, it's mainly acoustic. It's kind of like acoustic plus plus, because I wasn't quite sure what to bring. But I thought, well, I don't know, I just fancy doing some stuff, just trying to work out my route off the stage <laughs> when I want to get to the uh, organ over there. So this is an attempt at some things in imitation of birds. And the second thing, whoops, a daisy. The second thing you'll hear tonight is that dawn chorus from Estonia, which Dan Stahl collected and analysed, and I've transcribed onto the bells. But the first thing is the recorder. The recorder was always used in imitation of birds. In fact, the word record it's very interesting. We think about the recording. The word record comes from this device, and it also comes from bird fancying, because people used to eat birds, <laughs> things like finches, which they caught in Finchley, and they would play the, bird, the recorder as a luring device for the birds, because, you know, <laughs> make, make recorders sound like birds, and that's how it got its name, because it sounded like a bird. And a bird had learned to record. Re means again, cord, cordy, from the heart. It means that when a bird had learned its song, it had recorded its song, you know, as it, as, it, as it matured. And so the whole idea of recording music comes from the way that birds learn to sing and play back their song. And I've just seen my dog come in, and Colin, I'm about to play the organ right behind the dog, so you might want to... <laughs> this could be interesting. Um, in an imitation of dogs. So, um, <laughs> and so the first piece I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about it very briefly because um, <coughs> it's all about birds. We've got some wrens tonight and we've got the Estonian forest, but I'd actually like to start with um, South London and the crows. So the whole story is um, you have to picture the scene. We lived um, in a third floor flat that was level with the London tree canopy. And every morning, if we had a little bit of that rind of cheese left over, like the little last bit of parmesan, um, we'd leave it on the ledge for a crow. And the crows got wise to this really quickly. And sometimes you see one crow, and then another, and then another, and then another. And then it became a ritual. Um, every morning, the crows would be waiting for the cheese, sort of one gathering, then another, then another. And then it got to the point where there was a tap at the window one morning, and we realised, uh, yes, we realised we had a problem on our hands. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this is in honour of the crows. So there's also a love song. And it's called You Taught Me How to See the Crows. Thank you. 
Very positive, the positive organs are they? <laughs> We've got the chair. This next one, <laughs> this next one is called Camberwell Beauty. Thank you. Um, this one is called A Wren in the Cathedral.
what, Sam? Uh, some people may need to chip off to get a tray. Is it nine? All right, I will, I'll just do a quick one then. I'll do a very, very quick one. I'll leave a little even wanting more. <laughs> yeah, I'll turn, no, I don't want the mic on for this. I'm gonna do this one completely a cappella. A cappella, is that the word? Um, acoustic, sorry, I don't know why. Um, yeah, so this one's just called Vardoga. It's a, it's a prelude, it's an, it's an improvisation. So, so a Vardoga is a, a spirit um, who spooks you. People see this person a few moments before they see you, so they sort of pre-walk your life. This is uh, an old Norse myth, the Vardoga. So you see them a lot around Billingsgate because that, that was a Viking settlement in London. So I, d I don't know why I'm telling you this, but anyway. Um, <laughs> so I, I, this is how I imagine it would be like, how it would feel if you were in the presence of a Vardoga. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you. 